What is up guys, Ops Nurcho here, back again with another Monday Night Rewind podcast where we go back 20 years to the Monday Night Wars and cover Raw and Nitro from 1998. Now remember this will be the last week we do Nitro because of their whole three cha- uh, move to three hours and everything, so we won't be covering it any longer past this week, but we're going to be switching it up different. There's something I think will be kind of fun and cool. But this week we're looking at January 26, 1998, and we're covering Raw 244 and Nitro 124. So so we'll start off with Raw this week, and it got an average rating of a 3.48. So, of course, the rating went down after the whole um, stuff from last week with uh, Mike Tyson and Stone Cold and everything that kicked the rating up and, you know, shot it high. And, but this week we go back down. But then we see Nitro's rating go back up a little. So it just kind of balances out or whatever from Nitro rising and or from Raw rising and Nitro dropping a little to switching it now where Raw is back down again and Nitro is up. But the Raw took place in day. Davis, California at UC Davis, so University of California at Davis or whatever. And so the show kicked off with a replay, as it would and should from last week, of the Mike Tyson and Stone Cold thing, as they keep going back and referring to throughout the whole episode. So we get the whole replay of the footage, and then there's like the stuff that happened backstage with uh, Vince and stuff and Mike Tyson afterwards. And it uh, has Tyson saying that he doesn't want to be a guest referee. He wants to face Austin at WrestleMania. And then it also plays a bunch of news headlines, so like from news channels and stuff like that that picked up the story and stuff where we're showing that Mike Tyson has returned to the ring and everything so it's kind of big news going around on national TV and all sorts of stuff um, but then we go into the actual show and then we kick off with a match that's Mark Henry coming out with the Nation of Domination taking on Ken Shamrock who comes out with Ahmed Johnson and the DOA so throughout the match as it's going on the crowd keeps chanting Rocky sucks of course because the rocks out there and then in the match, uh, Mark Henry's just using his strength and stuff to dominate. Of course, he's the world's strongest man, so he's going to use his power and stuff to control the guys. But Shamrock's able to use his brain, and he starts kicking Henry to get him down. And so, you, of course, since he has the UFC background stuff, he's using the kicks and stuff. That takes Henry down. But eventually, Shamrock hits a belly-to-belly suplex and starts to go for a pin, but the Nation of Domination comes running in, and they all start attacking Ken Shamrock. And then that causes Ahmed Johnson and the DOA to come in to start fighting off the nation. And because of all that, the ref threw out the match. So Shamrock got the win by disqualification. And as the fight's going on, the nation is able to escape the ring and they start heading to the back. We then go to a video package on the history of Undertaker and Kane and showing how they'll start with Paul Bear telling Undertaker all sorts of weird messages and saying that, you know, your brother's still alive and that you're murdering and all this stuff leading up to the reveal of Kane. So just everything that's went on with their, their whole storyline. Uh, but then we get the what they're calling exclusive footage from the Royal Rumble that happened when the show went off the air. And it showed um, a bunch of officials coming out and they were opening up the casket. Because if you don't remember, I guess I should kind of explain it. But during the Royal Rumble, which I know we go into like more stuff later, I believe, or they show more footage or something like that. So in the casket match between Undertaker and Shawn Michaels, Kane ended up coming out and choke slamming Undertaker into the casket and they shut the casket lid on him. So Shawn technically got the win there. But then Paul Baron Kane put padlocks onto the casket and then rolled it up the to like the entryway and Kane started beating it with an axe and then they poured gasoline on it and lit it on fire and afterwards you could see like officials or something opening the casket and there were no there was no undertaker in there so that's kind of what we get is um, seeing the officials open the casket and stuff proving that the undertaker was not inside so something's happened to the undertaker you know is he dead or whatever so that's kind of like the big thing that's going on then next up we get a match of Jeff Jarrett and Barry Wyndham coming out with all the NWA guys so Jim Cornette and the Rock and Roll Express taking on the Legion of Doom so in the match the Legion of Doom has control early in the match but Jarrett and Wyndham are able to get through control through cheating and the help from the Rock and Roll Express and all sorts of stuff but the LOD is able to get the hot tag and then they take over control throughout the match but then there's a distraction on the outside of the Rock and Roll fighting with Hawk and so that calls the ref's attention or whatever and he's distracted and when that happens Cornette throws the tennis racket up into the ring and Barry Wyndham hits Animal in the back with it and that allows Wyndham to get the pin on Animal with Cornette's loaded racket or whatever behind the ref's back so the NWA team gets the win there. 
Then we go back to the DX locker room and we have China and Sean holding up the title belt. So like the different title belts. So um, the European title and then Sean's uh, the heavyweight title or whatever. And they're just kind of holding them up looking back and forth. And while they're doing that, Triple H stands up in the background and pulls his pants down. And the belts are held. So where he's the way he's standing and the belts are held and everything is covering up his nudity or whatever. And so you don't see him naked and stuff. And of course that... Cause Common to be like, oh, come on. But we do that, and then it goes back, and we get a replay of the Tyson Austin stuff from last week. And then we go back, so probably there's commercial or something in between here. Uh, but then we go back to the DX locker room, and China is wrapping Triple H's knee up, because as you remember last week, Triple H ch- uh, challenged or said he would face Owen Hart tonight. So he's getting his knee wrapped up to be able to face Owen Hart. And then Triple H starts kind of promo on him. Saying that at even at 50% health, I'm more of a man than you. And I'm going to flush you away tonight. Of course, continuing on with the whole nugget stuff. And then um, it goes to Sean and he just starts commenting on Stone Cold. And he's like, you know, I'm tired of this. I'm trying to be a role model for kids. And Stone Cold comes in and he's just, res- you know, he disrespects our guests. And he embarrasses this company and everything. Of course, playing it that Sean's the good guy or whatever and stuff in this whole thing. And then with Sean being a good guy or whatever, he's saying that, you know, in all fairness and everything that I'm going to give up my title defense at WrestleMania so so Stone Cold can face Mike Tyson. He goes, that's the kind of guy I am. So, of course, he's getting out of a match at WrestleMania is what he's trying to do. But Triple H says, you know, but you're the showstopper. You're the main event and all sorts of stuff like that. And so you have to be at WrestleMania. And Sean's sitting there. He's like, you know what? You're right. And he goes, maybe I can do something else. And so he's just sitting there and he starts thinking the things. And he's like, maybe I can have a match with Sable. And he's like, no, 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 that wouldn't be good. Uh, maybe I can manage the minis. He's like, no, no, they don't like me after last week and stuff. And then he, um, you know, it's, he's like, it's getting kind of warm in here. And he pull, uh, like unzips his jacket and takes it off. And under, and of course, he's wearing a referee t-shirt, a black and white striped ref shirt. And uh, China, like, kind of looks at him and then uh, starts whispering in his ear. Because at this point, she's not like talking yet or whatever and he comes back and he's like that's it i can be the special guest referee for the match and stuff and so he's trying to push on this thing that instead of having a match with stone cold for the title he's going to be the referee in their match and then from there we go to a match of gold dust coming out with luna and they're taking on vader and when they come out they're both kind of dressed up as vader but it'd be as if vader's outfit was lingerie but gold dust has the like vader's mask like painted on his face and stuff and they come out to his music and everything and so they're just kind of be trying to be vader but in the match luna ends up helping gold dust to get the upper hand but vader is able to hit the power bomb and they go up and hit the vader bomb But as Vader starts to go for a pin, the lights go out and Kane's music starts playing. So Kane and Paul Bear come walking out to the ring. And as they get in the ring, of course, Goldust has exited the ring at this point. So Vader goes up to Kane and they start fighting. And Vader's actually able to get the upper hand and kind of control Kane. And he hits a pile driver on him. But as uh, Vader, after Vader hits the pile driver and he's starting to go to do more stuff to Kane, Goldust starts to come back into the ring and that draws Vader's attention. So Vader starts to go after Goldust. But Kane gets up at this point and then he attacks Vader and hits him with a tombstone taking out Vader. Then we got some like, I guess some like exclusive footage or whatever. And it's of Mick Foley and Terry Funk. They were in the ring before the um show tonight at least i assume because there are people setting up stuff and i assume it was before this night or whatever but they were just sitting in the ring talking back and forth to each other and stuff and they were just talking about their match tonight against the new age outlaws and um just you know talking about stuff they'd each like to see the other do like mick says that you know he'd like to see terry do a moonsault on to the guys and stuff just kind of like you know egging each other on or whatever for moves and stuff and then that leads us into hour number two and it kicks off with the new age outlaws coming out to face Cactus Jack and Chainsaw Charlie, as we just mentioned. Um, the Outlaws come out wearing baseball gear, so they have, like, a uh, mask on and, uh, like, padding that the catchers wear and stuff. And so, the, you know, I guess wearing it so they don't get hurt or whatever. But as Cactus Jack and Chainsaw Charlie come out, Billy Gunn goes running up the ramp and he attacks him, and Cactus starts fighting with Billy. And then Chainsaw Charlie gets in the ring and starts fighting with Road Dog, and that's how the match starts. But the New Age have control on Charlie because of obviously their age and, or his age and stuff. They're able to get the upper hand on him and stuff in the match as they actually get into the ring and start the actual match off and stuff. But Chainsaw Charlie is able to get the tag to Cactus and Cactus comes in and fights off and he um, ends up hitting the double arm DDT. 
And then while this is going on, Chainsaw Charlie is on the outside, and he grabs some chairs and um, throws them into the ring. And when he's doing it, one of them hits Billy Gunn, which I thought was kind of funny. And Cactus eventually grabs one of those chairs, and he ends up hitting Road Dog with it. And then he, I think he's out on the outside, or Billy Gunn, one of them's like laying on the outside of the ring. Cactus is on the apron or whatever and goes running across the apron and jumps off doing his what would normally be like an elbow drop type thing that uh cactus or mcfoley does whatever but he had the chair under his arm so he like you know slammed the chair down onto yeah it was on billy gun on the outside and because of that the outlaws are able to get the win because of the whole chair shot and stuff and so they win by disqualification and then uh cactus jack and chainsaw charlie end up you know just nailing them all with chairs and then they take and pile up a bunch of the chairs on road dog in the ring and chainsaw charlie goes up and hits a moonsaw off the top rope onto road dog ending off the match then next up we get a little video package on takamichi noku like on his signing in the wwf and then winning the light heavyweight championship just highlights of his wwf career at this point and then that goes into the match of El Pantera taking on Brian Christopher. And the match was introduced by Honky Tonk Man. So instead of Sonny like it has been, it's now the Honky Tonk Man for some reason. Um, at one point in the match, Pantera kind of does kind of a cool move. So he's on, um, so Brian Christopher is staying on one side of the ring. So say the side that's like the camera's always facing. So the hard camera, it's like the camera that's always shooting the ring. Brian Christopher is standing like on the ground on that side of the ring. El Pantera is on the side that the entrance ramp is on and he's on the apron and he runs a like down the apron and jumps in between the top and middle turnbuckle and jumps dives through out on the Brian Christopher onto the floor so I thought that was kind of a cool move different thing than what we've seen normally at this point in time obviously nowadays that's nothing super special but back you know this time in the 90s that was uh, kind of cool um at one point Chris Brian Christopher ends up doing a sunset flip on Pantera who was on the apron so when he does it Pantera goes flying down to the floor and it looked kind of nasty him hitting his head on the ground and stuff but it, back in the ring Pantera ends up doing a handstand on the turnbuckle so like you see Jack Gallagher do today but as Brian Christopher run towards him he grabs a hold and does a head scissor onto Brian and then Brian Christopher starts to go up for a leg drop off the top rope but Pantera ends up moving and Pantera ends up getting the win by doing a roll up on Brian Christopher and that causes Lawler to be mad and angry that Brian Christopher lost. So he comes up to the ring to shake Pantera's hand because he said like if Brian didn't win he'd shake you know whoever the winner was because I assume when he said that he didn't know who the opponent would be. But he said he'd shake his hand so he goes up to shake his hand but of course as you assume with Lawler and stuff as he goes to shake the hand he attacks Pantera. Then we go to the back and we have a Cactus Jack and Chainsaw Charlie promo so they're standing up in like the back area where they have you know the like big barrels and the chain link fence and stuff that is like the backdrop they did for promos at this point in time and stuff so they're standing there talking and the dx comes so Shawn michaels and triple h end up coming up and interrupting saying that oh they didn't mean to interrupt the hardcore legends and kept going on and all this stuff about legends and as they doing that you see movement from the curtain behind the chain link fence and out comes the outlaws and they run up and push on the chain link fence and it falls down on top of cactus and chainsaw and so they kind of like pin them under the whole fencing stuff but eventually Ch cactus or mcfoley mankind whatever everyone call them is able to get out from underneath it but they're just kind of pinning chainsaw down under the chain or under the fence and stuff and then they're just beating up cactus and everything and they're hitting them with barrels and throwing the barrels on top of chainsaw and stuff while he's pinned down and everything so it's just kind of fun i don't remember seeing that before so that was kind of fun then next up we get a match of the Quebecers taking on the Headbangers. So the B Quebecers get control early in the match and they attempt at one point to hit a double team move but one of the Headbangers ends up pulling on Pierre's foot who is up on the top rope you know going to do the move off and that crotches him on the top rope. And then the other Quebecer ends up hitting a sunset flip and gets the pin on the headbanger. So the Quebecers get the win there and then after the match they just start beating up on the headbangers even more. Then we go to our last match of the night, which is the Owen Hart versus Triple H match. And so we have Triple H coming out with China. But as Triple H and China are walking out, we notice that it is actually Goldust and Luna dressed up. So Goldust is dressed as Triple H and Luna is dressed as China. And of course, this pisses off Owen Hart and he's mad and everything. He's calling for Triple H to come back down and stuff. But Goldust comes up behind him and gets control because obviously Owen was yelling, you know, towards the ramp and stuff, trying to call for Triple H to come out. But while he's doing that, Goldust comes up from behind and attacks him and is able to get in control. And then 
at some points in the match when Owen gets thrown to the outside, Luna starts attacking him on the outside and stuff too. But in the match, at one point, Owen ends up hitting a flying crossbody off the top rope. So it was kind of cool because they think he did like a run up the ropes and then jumped off into the crossbody. He hits an insiguri and then uh, knocks, and where <laughs> when he does that, it knocks Goldust's fake nose off because obviously Triple H has a big nose. And so that's always a piece of comedy thing when people try to impersonate Triple H is always having a big nose. And so when he does that, the nose goes falling off Gold Dust's face. That was kind of fun. Then at one point, Owen hits the ropes as he's bouncing off and stuff. And Luna hits him in the back with a crutch at that point. And Gold Dust, that allows Gold Dust to get the upper hand and, he, hand. and he starts to go for a pedigree. But Owen's able to counter out of it and gets Gold Dust into the sharpshooter. And so Owen gets the win for the match. And after he wins the match, DX ends up coming up on the Titan Tron saying, you know, how stupid are you, Owen? You know, I can't face you or whatever with my knee and everything and that you fell for this match, whatever. And so while they're up there, Sergeant Slaughter comes walking out. And then he gets on the microphone. Of course, DX is making fun of Sergeant Slaughter and everything. But Sergeant says, you know what? With your actions and um, the way you're dealing with stuff, that since you were signed this title match and stuff, that since Owen won, he's now the inter or European champion, I think is the, yeah, the title that he has. And so he awards Owen the title for winning because Goldust had the actual title and stuff, trying to be an impersonate Triple H and stuff. So Owen now has the title. And of course that pisses DX off and they start throwing things around in the locker room. Then we go to a replay once again of the Tyson and Austin. So we just keep getting this. And again, showing off more news reports that covered the event and what happened. And then we go to Don King and he we have his response for on the situation stuff. And he mentions that the Nevada State Commission, so stuff that the wrestling always has to deal with with the like commissions and stuff, will not allow Tyson to fight. But um, him being Don King and Vince McMahon are talking and then they're trying to think of creative way to get the two of them together. So Austin and Tyson and ring together. But they're not sure what will happen, but something will happen, though. They're guaranteeing that between Tyson and Austin at WrestleMania 14. And then the show ends with a promo of Stone Cold coming out to the ring. And he mentions that Tyson embarrassed him last week by pushing him and that he will kick Tyson's ass anywhere, anytime. He will kick the gold tooth out of Tyson's mouth and turn it into a necklace. And then he also mentions that he will be in Houston, Texas for No Way Out, the, pay or the next pay-per-view for February. And so if Tyson wants to face him, he'll be there so he can come there and find him. And he says, if you show up, I will knock your ass out. And so that ends off the show with that promo of Stone Cold just continuing on this build of Tyson also trying to keep up the momentum with their such high stuff from last week of ratings and news and all sorts of stuff between the two of them so they're just kind of trying to keep it up and keep Raw going in a good momentum so it was kind of a decent Raw it wasn't anything too spectac spectacular this week nothing really big or memorable happened that I can think of but it was just um, pretty decent overall and not bad to watch and so now we'll move on to Nitro, and this is Nitro 124 again from January 26, 1998. And this drew a 4.7 rating, so as I mentioned earlier, the rating is back up this time, higher than it was before. And this took place in Fort Wayne, Indiana, so once again, I'm from Indiana, so this is in my home state and stuff, so kind of fun to see shows and stuff. And I thought it was kind of interesting, I'm like, wow, a show in, that took place in my home state, and it's the first of the three-hour roll, or Nitro is causing me to stop watching Nitro and stuff. So this will be our last episode of nitro that we cover like i said i wish i didn't have to do it because i like the whole getting the contrast between raw and nitro and seeing what goes out you know the wrestling history between the two shows but with it moving on to three hours from every or for every episode up until like the nine or up through 99 at some point i believe when they decide to stop doing that but i just can't take three hours i mean i know it's less than three but that extra hour of time or whatever every week and so we're going to do some kind of fun instead that i've mentioned in the past and stuff so you'll see that next or hear that next week for the first time so the show kicks off with footage from sold out um obviously this is the night after the sold out pay-per-view and it shows where piper was in the ring and stuff and announced that the hogan versus sting match will take place at super Bowl for the title so it's supposed to be whoever the champion was taking on scott hall for winning world war three but because of this whole situation stuff it's going to be hogan and sting and scott hall will either get the title match later on or he'll act earn or something and i don't remember what happens there so hall will not have the match so that kind of makes him mad also 
But the show kicks off and we have commentary talking about, you know, stuff related to events last night. And it's mentioned that the Giant was injured by Kevin Nash due to Kevin Nash's powerbomb. So that will take place or stuff from that will happen throughout the night. And then that Larry Zbysko did beat Scott Hall, but Dusty Rhodes turned on him or on WCW and it has joined the NWO. Then we go to our first match, which is El Dandy taking on Ultimo Dragon. Throughout the match, the Ravens flock ends up coming out to ringside, which draws fans' attention. They're up yelling and screaming and stuff as it's going on. And nothing really exciting happens in the match, but Ultimo Dragon ends up hitting an Asai Moonsault and then the dra- puts on the Dragon Sleeper on El Dandy to get the win. And then we go to our Nitro Party winner. So this is the week where they feature the Nitro Party. And so we have me, Gina, and the Nitro Girls in Chattanooga, Tennessee at UT Chattanooga. So University of Tennessee, Chattanooga at the fraternity house that um, won the Nitro Party thing that was announced a couple months ago or weeks or months, whatever it was ago. And so as I said, me, Gina, and Nitro Girls are there. And so it's just a bunch of craziness and yelling. And um, so they go, they start like out in front of the frat house and they like start going inside. Of course, it's all loaded with people like on the outside they try to go inside the house and it's just loaded with people and like the camera's trying to follow the nitro girls and mean gene into the house and stuff and it's just struggling to get through all the people and everything but it's just kind of fun to see all these college kids and stuff on nitro and everything it's just kind of funny and um stuff that's kind of i would say not want to be shown on tv nowadays but it's just kind of fun we go back to nitro where we have a next match of brad armstrong taking on goldberg So as Goldberg gets into the ring, Brad Armstrong has his shirt that he took off and he throws in Goldberg's face and that allows him to get uh, an attack or drop onto Goldberg to, you know, get the upper hand on him. And Brad takes a couple cheap shots at Goldberg, but Goldberg's able to get control. And I noticed this was like kind of a longer match than, I mean, obviously some matches are longer, some matches are shorter. They're not that long a match altogether, but this was longer for than a squash match for Goldberg. But Goldberg's able to get the spear and hit the jackhammer to get the win on Armstrong. We then have Mike Tenay who's taking the place for Mean Gene since Mean Gene's at the Nitro Party thing. So Mike Tenay's doing the interviews and he interviews J.J. Dillon. And so J.J. comes out and they show the footage of Kevin Nash dropping the giant on his neck during the powerbomb. Which it was just Nash is not able to get the giant up and properly. But they're playing it that Nash did on purpose and injured the giant stuff. So JJ mentions that injuries happen all the time in any sports, but they all take action to protect the guys. So they mentioned football with hat, pads and helmets and hockey and all sorts of stuff. So he says, so WCW is banning the use of the jackknife powerbomb from any wrestler. There will be a huge fine and suspension on any wrestler that does. And if Kevin Nash uses it, it again, he will be fined and escorted from the building and possible legal action taken against him if he does it. So again, setting up that the powerbomb is now banned from WCW and then stuff for Kevin Nash of not being able to use it anymore and being punished. We then go to our next match of Conan coming out with Vincent and he's taking on Jerry Flynn. And so in the match like is going on stuff. I just like was watching Jerry Flynn and I noticed something about him. So obviously he's not a big name because I never heard of him before. So I assume if he was a big name, I know who he was. But for those of you that don't know who he is, I realize that he's pretty much just Steve Blackman. So if you remember or know Steve Blackman, he's Steve Blackman, but with a mullet and has a lot more personality because between like when he, you know, knocks Conan down or anything, he'll do like preening to the crowd and just stuff like that. And he just has a lot more personality and not just the like deadpan face that Steve Blackman kind of always had and stuff. So I'd say if he was in the WWF, he'd probably and treated like Steve Blackman, he'd probably be a much bigger star. But um, since he's in WCW here, he's just kind of used as an undercard guy. But he has all like, you know, the karate background. He wears an outfit very similar to Steve Blackman and stuff. So that's why I got all that. But Flynn has control of the match until Vincent causes a distraction, which allows Conan to get the upper hand. And Conan ends up getting the win with the Tequila Sunrise. Then we go back to the Nitro Party and Mean Gene talks to the guy that sent in the Nitro Party video that, you know, won the competition and everything. And so they just talk to him about him sending it in and stuff. 
And then we come back and Mike Tanay interviews Steve Mongo McMichaels. So uh, Mike Tanay asked him about the Super Bowl last night because this is the night after the Super Bowl. I think I said this is the night after sold out, but sold out was on Saturday because of the Super Bowl. So this is two nights after sold out and the night after the Super Bowl. And Steve says he doesn't care about that. That was his past thing. He's now a wrestler and in the wrestling business and all sorts of stuff. And that he's angry at all the new guys coming in and showing up and acting like they're big shots and stuff when they're not here proving stuff like he has even though he's not really proving anything except for that he's not a good wrestler and as it's going on Davy Boy Smith or British Bulldog as you know comes walking out from the entrance or whatever and comes up behind Mongo and he starts like picking a fight with Mongo and stuff you know taking res- or resenting or whatever I don't know what the word is that of the stuff Mongo saying you know saying he is a new guy but he has a lot more history in this business than Mongo does and so Mongo challenges Bulldog to the back, put on his ring gear, and well, they'll have a match tonight. So we have that coming up. We can then go to the next match, which is Buff Bagwell coming out with Vincent, taking on Rick Steiner, coming out with Ted DiBiase. So as the match starts, Buff ends up attacking Rick Steiner from behind, but Rick's able to overpower Buff and uh, get the upper hand. And uh, he's doing kind of like the Buff thing where he'll hit a move and then start posing and stuff, kind of copying Buff and stuff, making fun of him. But at one point, Vincent tries to attack on the outside, but Rick Steiner punches him in the face, knocking him back, getting him out of the way, not really causing an issue. But Rick Steiner, back in the rings, is hitting finishers, but Vincent trips him up at one point. Not allowing him to capitalize on the stuff. And Scott Steiner comes running out at that point and starts attacking Vincent on the outside. Rick ends up hitting the Steiner Bulldog off the top rope and goes for the pin. But as he's doing it, Scott Steiner fighting with Vince on the outside picks him up into like a gorilla press and throws him into the ring. And when he does it, he throws him right on top of the pin and so breaks up the pinfall and stuff. And so the ref calls for the bell and gives the win to Buff by disqualification because of uh, Scott causing the whole situation. And so because of that, Scott Steiner starts going crazy and stuff, and he pushes the ref, and so commentary mentioned, you know, that's another fine for him and stuff. And then D.B. Austin and Rick Steiner and stuff are once again confronting him, and Scott goes walking out and yelling to the camera and stuff about the stupid refs and everything. And that leads us into Hour 2, where it kicks off with Kevin Nash and Eric Bischoff coming out to the ring for a promo. And Bischoff mentions that we, being the NWO, have been a target of WCW and that now because of this whole stipulation on the powerbomb, Nash is being singled out as a competitor and stuff. And so Nash gets on the mic and starts explaining the events of what happened and stuff in detail. And he's talking that the Giant need to be put out like old Yeller. And so I dropped him on the neck to put him out forever. And so it just, you know, turns it in instead of like a saying an apology or I'm sorry type thing. He turns it into an angle or the angle and stuff and starts taking credit for it and happy about it and making fun of the giant and everything. Then next up we have Wayne Bloom, which I had never heard of or seen before, taking on Jim Neidhart. And so this match with these two guys, it's not a smooth match and there's a lot of messy moves. And actually most of it's on Wayne Bloom, not Jim Neidhart. So that's kind of surprising. But Jim Neidhart's able to catch Bloom off the, as he dives off the top rope and he catches him and put hits a power slam on him and gets the win. So Neidhart gets the win there for, I guess, his first official match. Then we go to Mike Tanay who interviews Ray Trailer, And so Trailer just comes out and gives his thoughts on Kevin Nash and the NWO and then says that he isn't afraid of Nash and challenges Kevin Nash to a fight tonight. Then we go to our next match of Chavo Guerrero taking on Psychosis. This was kind of a fun like Lucha style match, there, but there wasn't anything big or noticeable that went on through it. But Psychosis able, is able to hit the guillotine leg drop off the top rope to get the win against Chavo. Then next up we got a match of Luis Spicoli. So I had never seen Luis Spicoli before. Like I've heard his name and then I eventually, um, once I looked him up and stuff, I realized I had seen him before in WWF as Rad Radford for like a brief second but I never had seen him in WCW yet so far so I don't know if he just came in but he was involved in the match last night in Scott Hall's match and stuff so he comes out and Scott Hall comes out with him and Spicoli's carrying the tag team titles which Hall and Nash have and stuff but Spicoli's carrying him for some reason so Hall comes out and he surveys the crowd and WCW got the letter pop and stuff but of course Hall counts it as an NWO win and stuff. But Hall announces that they have a new in- member to the NWO and that it's Dusty Rhodes and that this match tonight will be a test for Luis Piccoli to see if he's worthy to join the NWO. 
And so Hull leaves the ring and Hooventood comes out. And so as the match is going on, our commentator mentions about something going on outside. So it cuts to the parking lot and a car comes pulling in and Macho Man gets out by himself. There's no one else with him in the car. And he's all mad and comes walking into the building. And it goes back to the match that continues on for a few seconds until Macho Man comes running out the entrance into the ring. And he attacks Hooventood who is inside the ring and Luis Piccolo is on the outside at this point. And he ends up hitting a pile driver onto Hooventood. And so Macho Man gets in and starts getting a mic and everything. And while he's doing that, Louie comes in and hits a finisher on Hooventude on from behind and goes starts to pin Hooven or goes to pin Hooventude. But of course, the match was ended and stuff when Macho interfered. And so Louie just kind of lays on Hooventude and then gets up and starts celebrating like he won and stuff. So by this time, uh, so this is all going on behind Macho Man while he's doing that. And then it's also noticed that Elizabeth is out at ringside now and stuff, so she must have come running out after Macho. But Macho gets on the mic, and he starts calling out Lex Luger and is angry about what happened at Sold Out and stuff. And he turns his attention to Hogan, Bischoff, Hall, and Nash, saying that he doesn't want help from any of them anymore in his matches, that he can handle everything by himself and doesn't want them to ever come out anymore. And after he starts going off about that and yelling for... Lex Luger to come out. Louis Piccoli comes up behind Macho Man and Macho notices him and attacks him and taking out Louis. And while he's doing that, all of the NWO then comes walking out. So it's like every member of the NWO. And so Bischoff gets in the ring. He just starts trying to calm down Macho Man and from being so angry and stuff. And Macho saying, you know, he's sick of all of them. And then he points at Hogan and saying, I'm sick of you and everything and I don't want to you around anymore and Hogan says Macho wasn't looking good against Luger so he they came out to you know try and help Macho out and Macho responds that three things he's like three things number one the match wasn't over so I didn't need your help number two Hogan and Hall weren't organized when they came out help so saying that they weren't messy and weren't working very well together and stuff and not helping Macho out and then number three is that Hogan looked a lot better when he had gold around his waist. So again, taking a dig at Hogan for not having the title. And so that causes Hogan to get on mic and he's like, you know, everyone knows that I beat Sting twice and everything. Of course, the crowd's booing and everything because Hogan's claiming he won. So as the, Hogan starts going off on Macho and stuff, he starts like, you know, stepping closer to Macho, backing Macho into the corner. And when Macho hits the corner, he jumps out of the ring to the outside and goes out and grabs a chair and comes walking back over to ringside. And Macho says again, I'm like, that, that don't help me, I'll take care of Luger. And you, he's like, I'll worry about my stuff, you worry about your stuff, I'll worry about Luger. And you see if you can get that title back off of Sting. And stuff, and so it's still continuing to play in all these issues in the NWO, and that Macho Man is having issues with a lot of people, and now he's like announcing or saying whatever that he has issues with Hogan. We go back to the Nitro party, and it shows a bunch of the frat guys doing limbo. The Nitro girls are holding like something that the guys are going under and stuff, so it's them playing limbo. And then we come back, and we have a match between Raven and Mortis coming out with James Vandenberg. So as Mortis comes into the ring, he's the second person in the ring, and Raven's just sitting in the corner. So Mortis runs over and does a drop kick into Raven's nuts, and so that gets Raven up and moving and stuff, and he falls to the outside or whatever. So they start fighting around on the outside, doing all sorts of stuff. And as the match is going on, commentary mentions that Raven passed out in the crossface the night before to Benoit, so at or at the sold out, not the night before. And uh, so it's that Raven likes pain and punishment and stuff, and so that's why he just passed out in the hold. But at one point, Raven ends up doing a couple of running drop kicks. He'll run across there on the outside, run across the ground. He'll run up the steps because the steps have been moved because they've been throwing each other into it and hitting each other with him and stuff. So they're just sitting like out in the middle of the ringside area. So Raven runs across and runs up the steps and jumps off doing drop kicks onto Mortis and stuff. But back inside the ring, Mortis tries to hit Raven with a chair. But as he's going to do it, Raven ducks and Raven catches him and hits the DDT on him and gets the win. So Raven wins the match there. Then we go to commercial and come back and then we have Wrath coming out again with James Vandenberg taking on DDP. And so I noticed as Wrath came out, he wasn't wearing like his normal like armor or outfit. He does so like when Morris comes out, he wears the like skull stuff and everything. And Wrath had, I don't know what kind of outfit you'd call it, but he's not wearing that anymore. He's just wearing his normal wrestling outfit. But in the match, nothing happens. It was quite uneventful. But at one point, Morris comes running out to try and help. And James Vandenberg starts distracting the referee. And so Wrath tries to throw DDP into the ring corner where Wrath is standing there with something in his hand. Some kind of stick or something or a skull. 
but DDP reverses it, and so Wrath goes flying into the turnbuckle and knocks Mortis off apron, and DDP grabs Wrath and hits the diamond cutter on him to get the pin. And then after the match happens, Wrath ends up as Vandenberg and Mortis are in the ring trying to help Wrath up. Wrath grabs a hold of Mortis and hits the death penalty on it, and commentaries mention, you know, that they think it's an accident, that he thought it was ddp or something like that and vandenberg just starts yelling at him stuff saying like what are you doing and everything and so just kind of kind of possibly making issues there of them possibly breaking up then we have a mike today interviewing bret hart so Brett comes out and he mentions that he had a great match with flair at sold out and that flair is still the man no matter what you know he thinks and stuff that flair is still the man then he moves on talking about the Hogan and Sink stuff, saying that he doesn't care what Piper's decision about the belt's going to be. That all he knows is that he came here to become the world champion, and he's ready to prove that he is the best world champion ever. So no matter who gets the match or wins the match or gets the town stuff, he's ready to face them and become the world champion. Then we go to the Nitro party once again, and Mean Gene um, surveys the party, so it does like the whole Scott Hall thing. And the Indo- or WCW gets cheered, and NWO gets more booze and stuff. And then we get the Nitro girls dancing, and then Mean Gene says goodnight from the Nitro party and stuff. So that's the last time we see that for the night. Then we go to a match of Booker T taking on Saturn. And so in the match, Booker T a lot of the time is just dominating Saturn. But Saturn gets his chance at control and stuff and um, gets his stuff in. Booker T ends up at one point hitting the Harlem, Harlem sidekick and the scissor kick. And starts to go up for the Harlem hangover. But Hammer from the flock jumps the railing and comes up and pushes Booker T off the top rope. So because of that, Booker T gets the win by disqualification. So all the rest of the flock jumps the railing and comes in and they all just start attacking and beating up on Booker. Until Rick Martell comes running out and helps out Booker and they clear out the ring. Then we get Mike today interviewing Chris Jericho. And so Jericho comes out as the new Cruiserweight Champion. So he beat Rey Mysterio last or at Sold Out. And it's mentioned that Jericho attacked Rey Mysterio's knee. And that Rey is now having knee surgery and stuff because of it. Which I know from Rey and stuff, whatever. That Rey had issues, obviously, with his knee. And so he was having needed to have surgery anyway. So they um, doing this got him out of that. And so he could have his surgery and stuff. And so Jericho mentioned that he's um, sorry for what happened to Rey. And that he dedicates the title to him. And that he's thinking, then he starts thanking people for the title and starts like pretending to cry and stuff. Just trying to carry on with this whole thing that um, he's a really good guy and that he's the role model for people and stuff. That he needs to be a good person. But then doing bad things the whole time. Then we go to our match that was brought up earlier of Steve Mongo McMichael taking on the British Bulldog. So as British Bulldog gets into the ring, Mongo starts attacking him. And throughout the match as they're fighting, British Bulldog tries to do like the i think it's called the inverted suplex or vertical suplex something like that where he just grabs them you know it does like a suplex type thing holding them straight up in the air you know upside down and so bulldog was known in wwf for doing that sitting there holding them doing that for as long as he could and then dropped him but he's struggling to get mongo up at multiple points that's like the biggest example but he does it tries to do other moves and keeps struggling to get mongo up so i know bulldog had some sort of surgery i want to say it's like knee surgery or something after the whole montreal screw job thing until now so i don't know if he's just not healed fully or what's going on but he's having issues and stuff here but british bulldog in the end is able to get the win with his running power slam finisher then next up we have the match of kevin ash taking on ray trailer so as the match starts kevin Nash tries to shake trailer's hand but as he goes to do it, Kevin Nash throws coffee into Ray Trailer's face. So it's kind of always weird because Kevin Nash just keeps coming out with coffee cups and everything for some reason. But so you knew something was going to happen. And so that happens then. Then Nash immediately goes and hits a power bomb on Trailer. So as you'd expect, he's not supposed to do that and everything. So the refs come, a bunch of refs come running out. They start checking on Ray Trailer. And Kevin Nash gets out of the ring and immediately just sticks his hand out as um, security comes up and police and everything surround him. And they arrest Kevin Nash and start walking him out. And so Kevin Nash is now arrested for doing the powerbomb. Then we go to our last match of the night, which is Scott Hall taking on Lex Luger. And so as Scott Hall comes out, he cuts start kind of promo on Larry Zbysko saying that last night Hall exposed him as having no wrestling talent. And then, of course, that pisses Abisco off. So he start, gets up and starts to head towards the ring. But it's stopped by security. And then we go to a commercial comeback. And the commentary mentions that Zabisco was escorted out by security and stuff during the commercial. 
But in the match, Hall immediately starts to attack Luger's ribs and commentary is mentioning that, you know, he's doing it so Luger won't be able to get him up into the torture rack. But that doesn't work because shortly after, Luger puts Hall in the torture rack and starts doing it and waiting for Hall to, you know, give up or whatever. Macho Man comes running out and starts attacking Lex Luger. And so that allows Luger to get the win by disqualification. Macho Man grabs a hold of Scott Hall and just throws him out of the ring. And so Macho Man and Luger are now just fighting with each other. Macho goes up top and hits an elbow drop and starts to go up for another. But as he's doing it, Sting come, it shows the ceiling and Sting comes dropping down. Well, Sting drops like right next to the ring and close to the turnbuckle where Macho is at. So as he's coming down, he just kicks his leg out and hits Macho Man, knocking Macho Man off the top rope. And so Sting's down now, and so he gets in the ring and hits a Scorpion Death Drop and puts the Scorpion Death Lock on Macho Man. And so as he's doing that and has the hold on, Hulk Hogan comes out and helps Scott Hall up, and so they just start walking around the ring. And the whole time Hogan's just looking in at Sting and Macho Man, and Sting's just kind of watching Hogan and stuff. So, you know, Hogan's following Macho's orders and not coming in to help him or anything, and they're just watching him get beat up by Sting. And eventually Sting releases Macho Man and then goes over to the ropes and starts yelling at Hogan, trying to get Hogan to come in the ring after him and stuff, challenging him to fight. And that's where the show fades off. And so that's it for the last Nitro we're covering here. Um, like I said, if anything big ever happens, like in any of the Nitros, I may cover it in um, our stuff, our new stuff we're doing. Just, you know, bring up what's going on and stuff. But that's going to be it for Nitro because now they're three hours and that took forever and they're miserable to watch. But the show wasn't horrible. I mean, for three hours, it actually um, wasn't too bad, but it was just the length of time that made it seem so much worse. Like, I was like, oh my God, is this show ever going to end? But stuff wasn't too bad and it's kind of interesting that going on with the whole banning of the powerbomb which i remember from a kid but i also didn't remember anyone else doing it when i was a kid um only kevin nash and so i thought it was you know such a big thing you know that oh this is a band mood and you know i was a kid and so i bought into all this stuff because let's see this is 98 so i would have been six years old i would have turned six in november so um of 97 so yeah i would be six years old at this point in time so i you know it thought that was real and that you know the powerbomb was this horrible move and all sorts of stuff but then later on i realized wait a lot of people do power bombs and you know i just thought it was kind of weird and everything but it affected you know it's something i remember from when i was a kid and stuff but that's gonna be it for the monday night rewind this week i hope you enjoyed i know this stuff isn't probably the most exciting of stuff i was just kind of an experiment thing i was wanting to try out since i've been watching all the old rawls um i got up to about I think the first episode in June of 98 was where I ended before I started doing these episodes, this podcast and stuff. And then I wanted to, you know, know what was going on in Nitro because I always want to watch. But every time I watched, I just would get so bored and stuff. So I'm like, oh, I can do this. Watch this. That forces me to watch them. Then I can compare, you know, watch both of them, compare the two like, you know, other people do in podcasts and wrestling where they review shows and stuff. And so I was like, I can do that, you know, so people can see what's going on on both shows, same day or same Monday night and stuff from 20 years ago. And so it keeps, you know, with the time and stuff. And I enjoy that. But like I said, with the, I didn't notice or realize that WCW went to three hours permanently. And after seeing, you know, first couple of three hour episodes that they did, I was like, oh, God, this is going to be so miserable. And so I was my decision to either just stop the podcast altogether or. Or just drop Nitro and do Raw. And I was like, well, just doing Raw is not going to be very much content. So that's why we come up with the new stuff. Where um, So next week I'll hopefully be bringing my brother on. And then we'll just be kind of talking about the current day stuff. So we have the Royal Rumble coming up this weekend. And so we'll talk about, you know, whoever wins the Royal Rumble. And if anything match happens, any news. Which, by the way, um, this will be going up in a couple days. So I record these on Thursday night and then put them up Saturday. And so just before I started recording the podcast, it was announced that Vince McMahon is starting the XFL once again. So that's kind of interesting because that happened in 2001, I believe it was. And so at that point I was about nine years old. And so I very vaguely remember the XFL. I'm not a football fan in really any form. So I would, didn't care that much about the XFL, but I do remember like we had an XFL football and I think we did a whole bunch of stuff with like the teams, like we did, like made stickers out of the team logos and stuff or something. 
So I knew, you know, some of the stuff about XFL and everything. And so I was, thought it was kind of cool. And so now Vince has introduced that in 2020. The XFL will be back in full force, um, obviously with different changes and making it more appropriate for nowadays and where the guys should get or shouldn't be injured as much and stuff. So hopefully that t- works out well for them and stuff. So that's, so stuff like that, you know, talking about the XFL will be what we do in this stuff, but we'll also have my brother here who has a very different perspective on wrestling than I do. He's been a, he's older than me. He got me into watching wrestling and stuff. So he has a much different perspective and longer history in the wrestling company or wrestling in general and knows a lot more about independence and all that sort of stuff. So it'll be fun to get his point of view into things. So that's going to be it for the Monday Night Rewind this week. So if you would, don't forget to subscribe on the Apple Podcast app or iTunes to the Monday Night Rewind podcast. You can also check it out on SoundCloud and download or listen to the podcast there. Or you can subscribe and listen to on YouTube under the Awesome Nerd Show where every Saturday we have the little like video type thing with the audio podcast playing. Um, where you can listen to there. So don't forget to subscribe there to help us grow to get past this YouTube partnership program crap that they reintroduced, kicking us out of the program and stealing all our hard work. But you can also help support the channel by going to our Patreon where we don't have anything there beyond a $1 tier because I'm trying to think of what to do. I'm thinking maybe for like a $5 tier, giving a weekly um, podcast of just like everything else beyond wrestling because I know obviously my channel is not all wrestling, so not everyone's going to like wrestling. So um, maybe for uh, people I can talk about other stuff or even more wrestling stuff, I don't know, but just maybe doing that as maybe a $5 tier, but I'd have to, you know, see if anyone's interested in that, but I know I'm such, you know, a small channel that I'm not going to have people just jumping all over it, so that's why I just start at $1, so if you subscribe to the Patreon where you donate a dollar a month to uh, myself to help out the channel and stuff, you'll get a, um, once you do it, you'll get your name shouted out, or whatever name you put into Patreon, so you can make them funny or whatever. But you'll get that every single month um, on either this or a video or I'll do it on something just where people will hear, be able to hear and see that you do support the channel. And then we also have t-shirts on Teespring. You can go to teespring.com slash awesome nerd show and you can, we have two shirts. Currently we have an awesome nerd show that's based on kind of like a Star Wars type font is what it looked like to me. So we have that on the front and the lightsaber colors was the inspiration for that. And then on the back it says um, the nerd is strong with this one, you know take on the force and instead of the force it's the nerd and that same logo on the back or font on the back so you can get that shirt or you can get the podcast shirt which is has this logo for the podcast the mnr podcast based on the old monday or raw is war logo type thing so it's got the same kind of little design i mean it's not exactly it doesn't have all the like scratchiness to it because i couldn't figure out how to do that but it does have the same like colors and it's the stencil lettering which is what raw used to use and stuff so you can get that if you want to help support the podcast because that just buying a shirt helps out a lot more too. So you can find those there and we have a couple more shirt ideas to add to it once we eventually get the stuff worked out. So be sure to check those out for me and any support you can do to me, I greatly appreciate it. You know, this doing YouTube and stuff like this is a big dream of mine that I want to do. I'm kind of like got nothing else. I mean, I've got a job and other stuff, but it's just so boring and I have issues finding a job and stuff. So that YouTube's kind of what I'm hoping to be able to build as my life and something I really want to do and going forward and stuff and so I'm just kind of working hard pushing the dream Um, I know I'm starting out small and very slow and everything but I've been doing this for almost three years now and so just I appreciate anyone that does support me anybody that subscribes anybody that likes and comments because all of those things help you can follow on social media all the social media stuff are in the link but you can follow anywhere at awesome nerd show is all the names on twitter and facebook and everything so just any support you can do me, I greatly appreciate it. And I thank you for listening to these. I hope you enjoy or join us next week to see the new and or see and hear the new format. And I hope you like that as much too. But thank you for listening and we'll see you next week.